uh, and the lights. The lights are a little bright. Yeah. So this is TV. We're, we're streaming live, and the, the lights are back on. So I'm Roger Struckoff, the conference chair here of Cloud Expo. Well, welcome back for the third and final day. Thank you so much for attending. Hope it's been uh, valuable for you. As you saw, we had a lot of content, and we still have a lot of content today, a lot of great sessions, 11 tracks with a lot of topics. And um, what we've found over the last few years is most of those topics tend to stick. Our keynote speaker this morning is someone that we've known for a long time, and he's helped us quite a bit over the years to come up with topics that stick. And I think it was Mark that actually suggested, strongly suggested to, uh, to us more than 10 years ago to call this show Cloud Expo and, and stick with it. So we listened to Mark. Mark Kinkle has a long, even though you can see he's a very young guy, has a long and distinguished career in open source and management in this uh, enterprise software industry. He was a VP at Xenos. He was one of the main drivers at cloud.com. Uh, before it was acquired by Citrix, he was vice president of uh, community there. He served as a vice president at the Linux Foundation, as executive director of Node.js Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation, and now is uh, the co-founder of something called Trigger Mesh, which he may tell you about. But he's also going to talk about serverless, as you can see. And the question being, is serverless a, a passing fad, or is it really something that's going to be the future? So please, oh, and then after uh, we're finished, don't go away. Uh, Mark's uh, presentation will be followed by Anjana Fernando at WSO2, who's going to talk about how to conquer network applications. So please welcome Mark Hinkle, and take it away. Thank you, Roger. Before we get started today, how many people in this room are using serverless computing today? All right. How many people are using Kubernetes? Some kind of containers, Docker or otherwise. All right. Amazon Cloud Services, or Amazon Web Services, I should say. Google? Azure? All right. Thanks. I like to get a level set of where we are um, and what our audience knows and where we're going. So as Roger said, uh, my name is Mark Hinkle. Um, I've worked in enterprise software and cloud computing for the last 20 some years. I'm not nearly as young as Roger thinks I am. I wish I was. Um, <clears throat> but what we're going to talk about today is serverless and um, <clears throat> specifically for those of you that are old enough to remember the original men, men in Black, this is a reference. Apparently, Thor is the new Man in Black and is out this week. But um, um, what we're talking about today is serverless and how that compares to the monolithic um, architectures that we're used to. And um, this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek reference to monolithic applications. There's nothing wrong with monolithic applications, but the buzz and the evolving design patterns in the uh, cloud or around cloud native applications and cloud native applications were applications specifically designed to run in the cloud versus the monolithic applications that were specifically designed to run on your infrastructure in your own data center. <clears throat> and serverless is a big evolving market right now. Um, <clears throat> It says right now that, that by 2025, we will have a $19.8 billion market um, around serverless computing. And in that market, 81% of the enterprises that are using cloud computing will be doing multi-cloud. Um, AWS adoption rates are growing, as a, um, but as a percentage, they're decreasing because they're a bigger number. Um, Microsoft, Azure, Google, um, and others are all growing at a fast rate as well. And as we look at Amazon's serverless, uh, they talk about what, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they talk about what the problems are that people have when using serverless, and that's the automation of serverless, CI/CD loops, integration with events from other um, 
processes, um, management services, et cetera. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. So this is our example monolithic application. It has a model view controller. It's a multi-tier application. It typically connects to a relational database. Probably looks a lot like the three-tier programming model for applications that we've seen for many, many years. Um, this is what a cloud-native architecture looks like. Cloud-native architecture is a distributed architecture. It's probably delivered um, to a front end using things like HTML, JavaScript, um, maybe something like Nginx to uh, distribute and deliver that application. There's probably an API gateway that's broken out. Thank you. <clears throat> and there's a user authentication, user authentication method. Um, it might be something like IAM in, in Amazon Web Services, or it could be OAuth, et cetera. And then in the back end, rather than having those tiers, we have distributed functions. And those functions are the libraries of the cloud. So they typically do one thing, and they are an ephemeral, single-use application or program that, that is called by an event. It does some unit of work and shuts down. In the serverless world, we bill based on execution time and data transfer, typically. So your serverless function is called, it transfers some amount of data, and it, it's end, and then it's billed in milliseconds, typically. And it connects to some kind of database. Probably in the cloud, we're looking at things like NoSQL databases, or <clears throat> they can connect to SQL on-premise as well. So when we talk about serverless being the future, um, it is the future for a lot of the kinds of applications that we, um, we deliver today, highly concurrent applications, highly scalable applications with one even workloads. There's still quite a bit of reason why you would continue to have applications that aren't cloud native. Um, their um, serverless applications, for example, are stateless versus stateful. Um, so that's, that's one of the par programming paradigms that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And here's what, what our big IT vendors say about serverless. Um, um, <clears throat> this is Sadia Nadella at Microsoft speaking uh, um, the Build Conference in 2017, and he's talking about the fact that serverless comp um, computation is going to change the economics of the way that we deliver software and backing computing. And uh, Microsoft, through their Azure functions, is one of, uh, one of the three, or, or one of the top five, I should say, um, deliverers of serverless computing. Um, Andrew Jassy, from, who's the CEO of Amazon Web Services, he says the same thing. He said that if they built Amazon today, they would probably build it as a serverless application. Um, they are adding uh, over 100, this was two years ago, they're adding over 100,000 new Lambda customers a month. I would assume it's probably even um, larger today. So this, this is what they're saying, but we're gonna talk a little bit about what that architecture looks like and why you might be interested in it. <clears throat> so at a very high level, serverless is uh, abstraction of all your backend infrastructure. Um, so in the, in the old cloud days or the first generation of cloud, it was the virtualization of your infrastructure. Now it's the complete abstraction of your infrastructure to the application layer. So developers can actually deploy their applications, have those applications be managed from um, <clears throat> scale up and scale down without having to worry about operations. Some people talk about no ops, which I think is a bad descriptor, but um, it, it abstracts the operational complexity from the developer's point of view and gives you the ability to not only scale up, but serverless, um, app, serverless functions scale to zero. So when those serverless functions aren't being invoked, you're not burning cycles. <clears throat> Typically, a serverless function does one thing. It resizes an image, it um, creates an ETL function um, for data transformation, it does um, some unit of work, 
does it well and shuts down. Well, I, I should say, if it's written well, it does it well. <clears throat> you can host it in the public cloud. So I've mentioned Amazon Lambda. I've mentioned uh, Google Cloud Functions, Azure, IBM, Alibaba. They all have serverless infrastructure that you can host your functions on. There's also a uh, popular project from Google, which is called Knative. And Knative is a um, project that go runs on top of Kubernetes and allows you to have a Lambda-like experience on your own infrastructure. Serverless functions run and are executed in runtime. So these serverless functions are probably um, most, most commonly done with JavaScript, but there's Python, there's Go, there's Java, and there's an, a, a growing number of execution environments where you can run these functions. And they're event-driven. So if you have an EC2 image today, you probably have a highly available application that runs all day long, and when you call that application, it, it does some unit of work. In a serverless environment, the serverless application is invoked by some event, and this is event-driven programming. So a file is uploaded to an S3 share. A table is updated in a database. These kinds of things are the triggers that actually invoke a serverless function. And then the serverless function runs, and when it's done running, it shuts down. And so these are micro-build. These are built in milliseconds versus hours. So if you have an EC2 image that you've, you've bought in an hourly fashion, during that hour, your application may be running all hour, but in most cases, some portion of that hour, the application is idle. In a ser and this is where the serverless novelty comes in. If I have an application that just only needs to run upon invocation, I can, I can just run it then. And perhaps think about e-commerce or other things that are, are time sensitive. The highest um, number of uh, <clears throat> volume might be during, during a peak time, like Black Friday. They can scale up during that time to massive amounts of um, users and then scale to zero once their big holiday season or scale, scale down considerably without having dedicated EC2 images running or other compute images. And I'm just using EC2 because that's a common, um, one of the most common ways that people are using uh, cloud computing today. When I say function as a service, that's what the serverless infrastructure in general usually indicates is I am delivering function as a service. <clears throat> And it's an abstraction of back-end infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> you can have function as a service in the cloud, or you can run it on-premise. I, I mentioned earlier that there was uh, Firecracker, or I'm sorry, uh, Knative and Kubernetes, but there's also Firecracker, which is the open source project that runs, uh, that is derived from Amazon Lambda. And these functions consume what is typically referred to as backend as a service, so storage, um, databases, et cetera. These are examples of um, as backends as a service, the uh, um, Azure Kubernetes service, so Kubernetes delivered without having to worry about how to run the un underlying infrastructure. <clears throat> Here's an example of a simple serverless function. Um, it is a very, very dead simple function, but um, let's take the, the uh, example of a photo sharing service. So you take a picture of something on your phone and you upload it to your photo sharing service. When it's uploaded, there is an event trigger that says, I've uploaded my, my photo and it went to Amazon's S3. When that, that photo is there, it invokes a serverless function that creates the thumbnail to display in your profile on your photo sharing service. Once it, once it um, invokes that function, that function resizes it, writes it back to another S3 share, and you can see those, those images from your phone in your application. That's a good example of um, something that um, runs as needed, is invoked by an event, and can, it can happen all the time. This is very, very simple, but I thought it was important to, to talk about how that works. 
When we talk about serverless, we also hear the idea of microservices. And microservices play well in the serverless space, but a microservice serverless isn't necessarily serverless. Um, a serverless function typically falls within the definition of a microservice. It does one thing. Um, uh, it is part of a distributed architecture. Um, but you could run a function on a uh, compute instance and have it 100% available. But sometimes people interchange microservices and serverless, and that's not necessarily correct. And there may be a good reason why you might run a microservice in a, um, <clears throat> in a, comp a compute instance versus in something like Lambda or Google Cloud Functions. For example, you want it to be 100% available. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about invocation time. There's something that happens that people talk about is the cold start problem. So a uh, constantly running function is always loaded into memory, so it, its invocation time might be faster. And this is just a simple diagram of how a storefront inventory app might work, where, <clears throat> where you have multiple services running and writing to different databases, and those databases are loosely coupled into a cloud-native application. Event-driven architecture is the term for um, the way serverless applications are typically developed. So I've, I've mentioned this multiple times, but if you see event-driven architecture, it means something happens that causes the program to run. Um, and this, this, the functions, uh, or the functions as a service, the serverless functions, et cetera, these functions are typically today being consumed by events running within the cloud that is um, hosting the function. So Amazon has different services that might invoke that. So as I said before, you have S3. There's S3 might be uh, sending a message to Amazon's simple queuing service, SQS. That SQS event is what triggers the function. We're going to go a little bit beyond that, because this is where I think the market is going. And as I said earlier, this is 2019 and beyond. And I'm just talking mainly about way, the way things are today. Here's a more complex uh, look at what the cloud native application might look like. Um, <clears throat> so on the front end, you, t you are going to have something that's serving your application. And it might be N N Nginx, maybe um, one of the popular ways to, to scale out the front end of your architecture. Um, JavaScript was the first use case for Lambda and Node.js. Um, so Node.js is, is very popular in the serverless space as well, because JavaScript is an event-driven uh, language. And you may have your application being written in a framework for JavaScript. So React, which if you're not familiar, is the um, interface for Facebook, and Facebook open sourced that, and that's a very popular user interface. But <clears throat> In this application, we're going to talk about the fact that there are multiple um, entry points, uh, <clears throat> various places that you may, uh, may be um, running your serverless functions, and they may be running in multiple clouds. So in our original application that I showed you, it all ran in, a, in Amazon. And so that was a Lambda function. And you see the Lambda function in my diagram there. But Perhaps uh, your application is actually running, um, your front end is running in Microsoft Azure. So how do you, once you resize that thumbnail, communicate across clouds? I think this is where the industry is going to problem solve in the future, and it has a lot to do with um, the way I, I see enterprise applications or cloud-native applications developing. And there on the right, that's the Heroku sign, and Heroku is Salesforce's cloud. So you have Lambda doing heavy lifting of resizing an application. You have Microsoft that alert, alerts everyone who's a friend in your um, photo application that you have new images there. And then you also are using Heroku and Salesforce for your billing. And, and so all three of those clouds will probably in the future play a role or could play a role in your application. So where serverless is a good idea today. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, asynchronous concurrent applications are typically a good use case um, for serverless. You want to parallelize work, so um, let's just say that it's the lunar eclipse and everyone is out in the middle of the night taking pictures of the lunar eclipse and at night they're going to see a huge spike in the number of images uploaded to their photo sharing application. Um, you can parallelize and do a number of those um, image resizes concurrently and only for that short time as people were uploading it and then they scale to zero. And scale to zero is probably the thing that makes it serverless most interesting but is not as apparent because scale to zero allows you to, to only bill based on invocation versus something like a compute instance which is constantly running. Um, obviously infrequent or sporadic demand, my Black Friday um, example. <clears throat> There's another, another really interesting um, in enterprises I'm seeing. People have a lot of applications that are infrequently used. Audit applications they only use once a quarter or once a year at financial institutions, but they want to have those, those applications available for when it's time to audit without having to re regenerate it but not have 12 months worth of compute running when they only need two weeks. Um, <clears throat> These, these serverless functions are also, I've said, stateless or ephemeral. They come and they go. Um, they do not have any idea of past transactions. Even though you can write using those functions to databases and other persistent um, data stores, the actual serverless function is typically ephemeral. Now, there is a, a conversations about how we could do stateful applications in serverless, and that may be the future, but it's not clear right now. The, the overarching use cases for serverless today are for stateless ephemeral applications. And the thing that's great about um, serverless and microservices in general is that it's good for highly dynamic businesses. So in the case of Netflix, the way they architecture, their architecture worked, when they started using a microservices architecture, they'd have version one of a service. And rather than updating that version one and taking it out of, and going to version two, they let version one run, and then they would uh, bring up version two of the service concurrently so that they had zero disruption, and then the developers can consume that. And that's, that serverless architecture, microservice architecture, is very, very um, conducive to uh, rapid change in businesses. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's a list in a, of examples for serverless use cases. Multimedia processing was one of the, the things that I discussed as far as image processing, but also um, especially with the access to um, <clears throat> serverless on GPUs, you'll be able to um, uh, <clears throat> encode video more quickly and uh, only for over the time you need it. Uh, database changes or change in data capture, so um, ETL, uh, extract, transform, and load of data sources. Um, Chatbots are very, very popular for this because they are invoked when you come to a website and you start chatting with someone and then they leave. <clears throat> mobile is a huge one for that because mobile, um, the, the architecture I showed you earlier for the cloud native application, allows you to pull various data sources into a front end, and these serverless functions may be running in your Dune data center or cross clouds. And there's the uh, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation is where Kubernetes is the home to Kubernetes. It's part of Linux Foundation. They have a really good white paper on serverless that sort of gives you a background, and I put a link to that. <clears throat> so, the benefits that we talk about in serverless are typically reduced cost, but that's sort of a red herring. Your serverless costs per millisecond when you run it out for an hour are probably, if you ran a serverless function for the whole hour, are typically more expensive than a dedicated instance. The reason that the benefit, the cost benefit exists is because that's dedicated. So if you only need 10 minutes of your hour to run your serverless, even though it might cost twice as much per millisecond, 
you're only going to pay one third of the cost as you would for computing. Does that make sense? So, so they're charging you more per millisecond, but you are not consuming a whole hour, and you don't have a dedicated resource, and you don't have to turn that resource on and off. <clears throat> um, risk mitigation is one of the uh, um, benefits that that people talk about as well because it's a distributed application. It's not a monolithic application. Um, so for example, <clears throat> if you have a Java application and you have an error in a library and you recompile that library and put it into production, that, that er an error might be introduced into your monolithic application and requires that whole um, recompile where with a serverless application, you can actually, a serverless function, you could rewrite the serverless function, and while it may have the error there, it'd be quickly um, updated to the end user who's consuming them. Uh, the scalability and f uh, flexibility is also by far that ability to scale um, to many thousands, which is a benefit and a risk as well. And we'll talk about the risks in a minute, but the benefit is that you have unlimited compute at your um, hands. If that, if that serverless function isn't written well and it keeps trying to invoke and doesn't complete its mission, it can eat up your, um, it can cause a huge amount of cost with your serverless application, with your cloud native application. And because serverless application or cloud native applications are um, made up of discrete units, typically you can deliver those discrete units more quickly with smaller teams and an architecture that consumes those serverless applications. So where serverless is breaking down, portability. So in portability, um, one thing that is, even though all these, applica these serverless application environments um, offer JavaScript, they may offer different versions of Node.js, JavaScript, Python, et cetera, so your application may not be able to move directly from Amazon Lambda to Google Cloud Functions or Knative. Um, uh, my development team did an open source project that allowed you to uh, port the Amazon function right to Google Cloud Functions, or Google's uh, Knative without having any kind of updates for that very reason. Um, <clears throat> automation, DevOps. Um, from the standpoint of Continuous integration in CI/CD, you uh, you may have to come up with a new um, continuous deployment process than what you have today. So typically, um, you'll have a new target with Amazon or Google or Azure or Knative, etc. Um, it's it's just more tooling, and once you have that tooling, then you can do um, realize the benefits that they talk about in DevOps. Um, uh, where the development cycle goes right into the operation cycle with, with limited friction. The one that I think is really interesting, and this is uh, where I've spent the last year working, is on cross-cloud communication. So as I said before, you have a function that runs in Amazon. And Amazon, if you have a greenfield application, most likely has all the tooling and all the services you need to deliver a cloud-native application. But what if you have an existing application that generates events in Google Cloud, and you want to be able to uh, generate, invoke a serverless function on Amazon? Um, that's where it breaks down. The other place is um, you're going to have an enterprise, and you probably have um, uh, enterprise event buses, things like Tib Tibco and IBM MQ and MuleSoft. And those things would be logical ways to kick off serverless functions. And today, there's not a great way to do that. Now, earlier, I had spoken about invocation time. And invocation time is, since your serverless function is not loaded into memory the same way a compute instance is, there is what they call the cold start problem. So it may introduce a couple seconds or more of latency into your application. So some things that uh, um, serverless users do are they um, force the invocation of that serverless function every so often 
so that it stays resonant in memory. And if a serverless function is called, it's instantly in memory. And the latency is down because if you have an application, say you had a mobile application that pulls multiple data sources through multiple serverless um, functions, if each one of those functions takes a few seconds to up to invoke at the beginning when you go to a website, it's going to fail. And if there's uh, that slowdown is actually going to cause your user experience to be bad. So um, to Microsoft, not too long ago, offered a um, ser enterprise serverless offering that actually keeps your serverless functions warm in memory, but doesn't scale them up until you need to do that so that that invocation time is lower. So that's what they talk about. Is cold start problem is, is probably one of the most um, talked about reasons um, people dislike serverless or <clears throat> the other alternative, and this is why people run micro, why I spoke about microservices earlier, is those microservices running in a container are always warm, even though they, they don't have the same scalability. There has to be scaling logic to bring more containers online. They may actually, they will always be warm because they're in that container. Um, security risks in serverless, typically when you have a distributed architecture and more functions, you have a larger attack face. Um, a lot of those functions are consuming data from various APIs and endpoints, and uh, um, there's a lot of, of potential risk there. If you look at uh, Palo Alto Networks just bought two companies recently, one was called Twistlock and one was called PureSec. Um, they were additions to their evident I.O. Uh, cloud firewall where they're adding security to the cloud so that your um, increased attack face is better protected. Um, authentication is another one. Um, if you're using Amazon, you have um, your own IAM authentication method, but if you're using multiple um, sources, you, you're probably going to have um, <clears throat> occasional broken authentication, you have more authentication sources, it increases the attack face as well. Um, and I, I'm not going to go down each one of these security risks. I just wanted to give you an idea. Of, they're, they're not deal breakers, but they're considerations. And because you have multiple serverless functions out there, you may have them cross cloud, that you may have a bigger, uh, uh, a different consideration for security than you do in your existing data center. Um, as I said before, I'm the co-founder of a company called Trigger Mesh, um, and we provide a platform to manage the whole uh, serverless product lifecycle. So um, what we want to be able to do is be able to check out our code from a source control, Amazon, or I'm sorry, uh, GitLab, uh, Bitbucket, GitHub, deploy it to the cloud of your choice or on-premises. So. Um, <clears throat> Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft, or Knative running on top of Kubernetes have the ability to have that CI CD loop to move it around. Um, and we offer it as a hosted platform or on, on premise. Um, we are one of the, and, and we'll actually have nothing to sell today, I just am making you aware. Um, we're one of the uh, uh, top five contributors to um, Google's Knative project. And, uh, we're very proud of that. But we believe that in 2019 and on, the what, where we're going as a, as a uh, <clears throat> industry is the ability to bridge our large amounts of enterprise infrastructure to the cloud. So there are numerous reasons why you may want to um, offload some of your work and scale up your existing applications using serverless functions. But unless you have a way to communicate from your enterprise to, um, to Lambda, Microsoft Cloud Functions, it's, or Azure Cloud Functions, et cetera, um, you're going to be stuck. So what we do is we allow you to consume functions from TIBCO, MuleSoft, IBM MQ, that kind of thing, and trigger functions in, in Amazon Lambda. I think you're going to see a lot of other solutions along this way that allow you to scale your existing 
um, infrastructure investment in the cloud without having to rewrite but augment. And this is why that design pattern around microservices is interesting, is that you can create a microservice that can be consumed by one of those monolithic applications and make your monolithic um, enterprise application cloud native by virtue of these microservices. So you can expose APIs that way, you can exchange data that way, um, you can do a lot of the, take that library mentality for the cloud and allow that to um, extend your enterprise applications. So um, <clears throat> where, where, we're, where we see serverless falling short, um, and this is from last year in August, is a uh, uh, survey by the new stack, which is the um, cloud analyst and um, publishing firm. Portability was the number one um, cons was consideration. Uh, there were other, um, <clears throat> and actually the whole uh, new stack serverless survey is a really, really good resource as you're um, considering all that. <clears throat> um, portability, security, the cost of labor. There is no consideration for, um, there is no certification for serverless engineers, the same way that there would be a Cisco certified engineer, or none of, there isn't a vendor neutral um, cert right now that makes it hard to gauge how knowledgeable someone is around uh, serverless. I think even if, if they were knowledgeable, Amazon Lambda launched in 2014, I believe, so the most experienced engineer that you're gonna find has less than five five years um, in that area. <clears throat> the ideas around enterprise eventing is, is really going to be the next, uh, um, the next thing that I think we need to solve as well. And that's just how, how do I make my SAP application events transparent to an Amazon Lambda serverless or a serverless function running in my cloud. And this is, this is the architecture that we think is going to happen, is that you're going to have your source control, you're going to have Kubernetes on-premise, on you're going to have functions running, and in this case, uh, Trigger Mesh hosts functions just the same way Lambda does, but we like to call them enhanced serverless because we give you the ability to bridge clouds. And then we can push those, event, those serverless functions or consume events from your public cloud service providers. That's our architecture, but that's the architecture that I believe even Amazon and Google and IBM in their um, IBM slash Red Hat are going to be in in the future. So we do offer free serverless hosting, and I will tell you that um, so does, does Amazon and um, I believe Google and Microsoft have the free tier, but um, we like to call it enhanced because it gives you the ability to integrate and do your CI, CD, as well as um, um, alert from other clouds. So that is what I had today. I uh, appreciate your time. Um, are we doing questions, Roger? Yeah, there we go. Anyone have a question for Mark? Somebody has a question for Mark. I'm oh, right up front. Hang on a second. We're recording this and streaming it out. So with the mic, uh, everybody around the world will be able to hear you. Hi, Mark. Um, my name is Jose Medeiros. I used to work for Symantec on the VMware team. And one thing I found was that the VMware administrator, to try to justify the cost of VMware, would average out the peak usage of the servers and the VMs and say that we're only using like maybe 80% or 50% utilization. But during peak times is when customers complain the most because that's when they'd get disconnected. And I think that's the problem I'm having with Netflix and Hulu. And I think they're trying to spin up servers and uh, then the other question I have is, how do you do that with Oracle when you're doing e-commerce or SQL? And are these companies encrypting their passwords and not keeping them just in a big flat file like they do with big data? Because I think Google and YouTube are having security issues internally, and they're allowing their admins to have access to these passwords. And I think some my account's been hacked and need to delete my account. So 
So uh, I can't speak to any of their architectures, obviously, because I don't, I don't know what YouTube's architecture is, but I can take a guess that because these architectures are probably, whether they're using VMware or they're using compute instances, they have to have um, a scaling that makes them invoke a full virtual machine versus a more lighter weight serverless um, infrastructure. And the thing that, that's driving serverless is that you can over-provision infrastructure with serverless m to a much greater degree than you can with dedicated virtual machines. Because your peak load, unless your peak loads, as in the case of where you see the slowdown happen, that would actually max out those machines. But I think the reason it's so attractive to the cloud providers is they are going to be able to get more workloads on the same amount of infrastructure that they do with a virtual machine. Um, and the virtual machine itself, and this is more a function of containers than it is a function of virtual machines. So containerization is a lighter weight um, virtual environment. And serverless functions, essentially, what they're doing is they're spinning up containers in the back, running that serverless function, and the container shuts down. So that's, that containerization is allowing them, is why Docker and other container solutions have become so popular, because it takes up less resource and it still delivers you um, good application performance. So that's part one, is the over-provisioning. The part two is, is that authentication in the cloud is there isn't, there isn't a good you know, industry standard active directory for cloud. It's usually specific to an individual cloud. Um, I think Okta is probably as close as we have to a cross-cloud authentication platform. Um, but it's uh, also, you know, it is beyond the control of Okta to interface with Amazon, Google, and um, Microsoft with the same amount of fidelity as their on-prem and cloud authentication processes. Mark, uh, my name is Pavlik Kudin. Can you please comment on the, regarding the architecture? Because it sounds like that we need to adopt a new architecture, and then we have to have a couple of architectures coexisting. And how do we move from one architecture to the other in order to maximize the cost benefits that, and risk that you mentioned earlier? Thank you. Yeah. So there's a cloud native architecture that um, simply means built for the cloud. I don't think that you need to lift and replace all of your architecture, because many of your existing applications are already network aware. But you can extend your existing architecture by the ability to pass um, data eventing and other um, information from your legacy application to your cloud native application. So if we um, uh, look at the SOA design patterns from late 90s service-oriented architecture, Good idea, but it lacked in the uh, pervasive infrastructure and cloud computing and hosting that made it a, uh, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, that made it, made it possible. Today we have perv cheap pervasive network um, cloud computing and all, all, a lot of tooling that are conducive to, to a SOA um, architecture. So I, I don't think that there's necessarily a, re a mass rewrite of applications, but um, you can actually upgrade and integrate much more easily given the tools that exist today. Hey, Mark. Uh, my name is Rajurshi Choudhury. So I have just one question. Like, uh, if I use Trigger Mesh, uh, do I have something like a local testability kind of uh, thing I can do? Like, if I'm using multiple platforms or something, can I do some testing, like simulating things through your platform? There's a little bit of reverb from the mic, so I didn't quite get all of your application or your yeah. question. Okay, so my question is like, if I am using Trigger Mesh, uh, can I uh, simulate some situation, like do some local testing uh, through your platform before I deploy things? Yeah, so can you test using yeah. Trigger Mesh? You can test, you're more than welcome to use it. It's a free hosted platform that, uh, for now, as we're in our beta program, that you can that you can use it before going in deployment. Um, you can do the same with all of the serverless hosting providers, but um, the integration points are, are um, already in the platform, and you're, you're welcome to use it however you see fit, other than hijinks and, and unsavory practices, but yeah. 
I think we had one over here. Yeah, there it was. So <clears throat> reading between the lines, it sounds like what you're saying is serverless doesn't work for real-time or near real-time applications. It's only good for event processing in the background. That's true today. So real-time applications that Java excels at, it is not, um, it is not a application of that ilk. It's a different design pattern. So no one has a way to, besides, you mentioned Microsoft, but really no one has a way to keep a, a pool of warm start functions. Well, the, the way they typically do it is run with, for lack of a better word, a cron job that, that invokes that function every so often. And if, if the um, typical, historically, um, maybe a function stays in memory in Amazon for 15 minutes after it's been invoked, what they're typically doing is running a function once so it stays in memory and warms it up. And it's, it's, not, a bad, it's not a bad use case because those invocations, even for a millisecond, if it's a millisecond or if it's a minute, aren't, aren't super expensive to do that. But Microsoft just added that kind of, uh, and some of the monitoring companies are doing the same thing um, as well. So we have time for one more. Uh, we have a question right here. If anyone else does have a question, please feel free to approach Mark uh, once he leaves the stage. Thank you. I'm K.R.S. Murthy. I'm on the board of a multi-cloud management services company. Mm -hmm. And the serverless approach is basically a la carte. I want this, I want this, I want this, rather than uh, a broader set of services that are required and that is assembled by the, you know, um, the cloud and provided to them. Mm -hmm. Now when you have multiple clouds that you want to be able to access, how does someone decide which cloud is ideal for which microservices in the serverless environment? And the user should have complete knowledge of what are the components, which, is, which requires that they need to learn all of those uh, sophisticated users only, not everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so to boil it down, multi-cloud has a la carte services. How do you decide without causing a much of overhead for the end user? And the answer is, I believe there will be a number of services that arise that actually per perhaps test the execution time of the same serverless function across all three clouds because not all three clouds, even though they bill at the same amount usually because of market economics, you know, Microsoft may have um, uh, <clears throat> low latency memory in their cloud that, that performs better than, than Amazon serverless, or they may have faster processors that, that allow um, execution of sort of data processing ta tasks. I think what you'll see, and uh, is either big companies running uh, test suites against all three clouds to determine where their workload is best served, or you will also see um, perhaps, and this is probably farther out there than is uh, AI that's running those services and helping select which clouds. Now, in the original uh, infrastructure as a service phase, we talked about that hybrid multi-cloud approach. Um, I think we're a lot closer to that due to the fact that we have better AI technology today and a more pervasive cloud environment where you might do that. Um, what I do think you will do, though, is um, probably not dynamically do that, but from time to time it would make sense to check if you're being built at the time and the execution time is twice as high on Microsoft as it is on Amazon, then you may want to be moving to Amazon at the same price. But. Great. Thank you very much, Mark, and thanks for everyone for attending, and please feel free to approach them. Can I get our picture? I think we're getting a nice picture.